When we think about the, what I call the other opioid crisis uh, involving heroin and fentanyl, I think one of the most important things I want people to understand, or at least try to help them understand, is the fact that despite uh, what the media says, and often what the regulatory agencies say, and trickle down to what the politicians say, uh, and the forces that play on healthcare providers about there being an opioid epidemic, that it's not a single entity, as most people would want everyone to believe. Uh, I think the motivation for wanting people to believe that it's a single thing is because it makes it seem as if a single action is going to solve it. When in actuality, it's m more than one thing, and that requires different activities to help try and temper what's happening. Uh, one of the things that's become clear to me from a regulatory perspective is the fact that regulators are interested in one thing. They're interested in the number of people who are dying each year of opioid-related related overdoses to diminish. And they, looking at the epidemic as a single entity, has them look towards healthcare providers as becoming part of the solution. Therein lies the rub. And that's because of the fact that fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid, can now be combined with heroin to make it more potent, to make it more attractive, and also to make it, most importantly, more lucrative. Technically, is everything we're talking about an opioid? Absolutely yes, it all is. The real question is, is it a prescription opioid or not? Is it something that was obtained by a healthcare provider? And is that really what is fueling the opioid overdose fatality rate? What more and more people are starting to see is that the opioid overdose deaths are becoming more and more easily identified and related to heroin, fentanyl, fentanyl and now cocaine, and even fentanyl and marijuana. Fentanyl being a synthetic opioid medication means that it can be manufactured in any factory anywhere around the world. And that's exactly what's happening. It's being manufactured almost to the finish line in China, then being sent to Mexico, making the finished product, and then making its way into the country, either through the dark web, through the US Postal Service, through FedEx, through UPS, or through people carrying it across the border. $800 of fentanyl has a street value of about $800,000. That's an incredibly lucrative business model. Let's get back to the original question. Is there really a single opioid epidemic that we're experiencing in this country? And the answer is that heroin abusers three quarters of the time start off abusing prescription pain medications. And that has been connected to the healthcare community. Because if it's a prescription pain medication, we know that most often the way prescription pain medications make their way into the hands of people who are going to abuse them is by diversion, by sale, by people pilfering them from people's medicine cabinets and people keeping them around the house, not disposing of them, not storing them. That gives all of the regulators and the legislators the opportunity to look to healthcare providers to solve the problem. My goal in the talk about the other opioid epidemic, the other opioid crisis, including heroin and fentanyl, was to try and help people realize what the relationship is between the two, to help them think about how long it's going to take 
for the two crises to separate themselves as opioid prescribing becomes more and more restrictive, restrictive as ceilings of prescribing morphine milligram equivalents continue to be implemented to try and diminish the amount of opioids being prescribed. Facil facilitating that separation of drugs identified in overdose fatalities and having people not throw in the towel at the same time. Because what we don't want people to do is say, if there's all this pressure that's going to fall on my shoulders for something that I'm even not even responsible for, I'm going to just wash my hands of the whole thing. And the only people who suffer in that kind of situation are the patients at the end of the day. So that was really the goal of what I was trying to achieve. One thing that I think healthcare providers need to do in order to continue to minimize harms and stay in the game is to realize the importance of considering something beyond their relationship with the patient in terms of assessing risk-benefit ratio. For many, many years in my clinical years of practice, I considered what happened between a patient and myself to be the most important thing. And when I needed to assess a risk-benefit ratio, all I had to do was look at the patient, assess the patient, made sure that I took everything into consideration. And then I was able to put everything on the scale and come to the, the end result of risk-benefit. In 2018, and certainly moving forward, that's not the case any longer. There's what I call a new math that needs to be utilized. And that means that not only does the patient need to be factored into the risk-benefit ratio, the household needs to be factored into the risk-benefit ratio. The community needs to be factored into the risk-benefit ratio. And societal implications need to be factored in as well. Because we're not likely to be able to control the amount of illicit substances that come into this country. Fentanyl is not going to go away, but healthcare providers have a responsibility to monitor patients to see if there is any illicit substance use, and they also have a responsibility to now look at what the potential risks are in the penumbra that surrounds the patient. That's what I think healthcare providers need to do.